All right. So the three take-home points I'm going to talk about are really the importance of pre-planning the study, the stuff you do before you enroll a patient. And there are some differences when you're doing a study involving multiple sites in one site. The importance of timelines and milestones. This is a big one, something I didn't do in the beginning, but if you're not doing this when you're doing a network research, you're never going to be successful. And then the importance of communication. It's really the thing that probably the biggest lesson I learned when, when, when I did the reason study. So just so everyone is following up what the uh, mechanisms of the reason study were, um, we were looking at ultrasound and cardiac arrest. It was 20 sites that did local IRBs. We didn't have a single IRB then. Um, we organized it into central, the central site, which was UMass, regional sites, and then local sites, and then a reporting structure between. I'll talk a little bit about that later. And we met as a group two to three times per year. Our data entry was decentralized. It was through REDCap at each site. And there are pros and cons to every one of these decisions. The other thing was this was an unfunded study. Very different when you're doing unfunded network research than when you're doing funded network research. You do things differently. Because when you're doing unfunded, you're asking people to do it for free, basically. So there's really three phases of the study. And the way you organize them are slightly different. The initial study setup involves site recruitment. So you have to talk to your friends, talk to people who you think can do it, and you ask them if they want to be involved. Generally, it's not one conversation. It's six or seven conversations. You go through a protocol approval that is the group, which is probably the, the better part of a network is when you have that many people looking at the protocol, it makes the protocol better much quicker. It allows you to publish better because you find those little problems that, you, that don't wait till the editor points them out when you, point in, when you turn in your study. And then the IRB. The IRB initial study setup um, can be a central IRB now, there's a lot of that, or it can be um, at each individual site. Once you start enrollment, there's the obvious enrollment phase where you're bringing in patients, and we'll talk about how that works. Um, and then there's the data entry. Your decision is going to be uh, centralized data entry, meaning everybody sends you their data and you put it in, or data entry in the periphery. And again, there's questions for each one of those that at the end, if you want to talk about them specifically, I'm happy to go into more detail. But I chose to focus on the three kind of core lessons. And then post-enrollment, not the enrollment phase, but after the enrollment is done, there is the data entry portion of it. And again, those decisions, how you set it up, depends on how you're going to do that. There's the data review and collection, or correction, which means you find whatever things are wrong. So the one that we would have is they'd have an age of um, 111. You're like, I don't, I don't think that person was 111. Were they 11? You know, was it 91, 81? Like, what was it? So there's that type of correction. And then the analysis phase. So site recruitment for a network study, it depends on how big you want the network to be. So when we did it for a reason, there was a request for applications that went out. And basically, it's a conversation with each site. We had 36 sites who applied for participation in the study. Of that, eventually 20 completed the study. Um, the most important thing at this stage is to have the expectations out there. And it's really expectations of what you want them to do and what they will get. So they're going to look at the protocol and decide if they can do it, but you tell them that if you do X, you will get Y. Generally speaking, in an unfunded study, it's authorship on the manuscript. Um, that type of discussion is much better as a group, but you have to have it four or five times because people don't listen to all the details and there's a lot that happens those first couple of meetings. It's a two-way street. Not only are they asking you, you're looking at them to say, geez, can they do this? Are they going to be a problem site? So it's really kind of an interview and an offer at the same time. So this is our enrollment for reason over time and you're looking at basically every three months we would have a meeting. And as you see this enrollment, there are actually a couple of times that you see these jumps in enrollment. Anybody, under, anybody have a guess as to why you see these sudden leaps? Say it, say it loud again. Right after the meetings. That's exactly what it is. If you look, October is ASEP, April is SAM. 
right after meetings, what happens is everyone's doing their thing. Because it's not a funded study, they're kind of off doing their own thing. You get together and you go over things, you tell them what should be done, and people either do one of two things. They either realize they were doing it wrong and you just lost them. Eventually they get exhausted and they stop participating. Or they were doing it right, but they lagged on one phase. And what they always lag on is they enroll, enroll, enroll. They don't put anybody in the database. So we would have our meetings, I'd say, you guys aren't enrolling them in it. Everyone would say, no, we're enrolling them. And I said, then put them in the database. And this was that surge of them catching up with what they hadn't done in between. Which gets to the number one thing I learned for this, and it is communication for a multi-center trial is absolutely critical. It's a balance. Everyone here has a job. What do you do when you have someone who sends you an email a day? You never read them. They're just the emails that are four pages long, you delete them each time because you just don't have the energy to wade into that. Communication is a balance. You need to keep everyone going in the same direction, but you can't overwhelm them with the details. So lots of things are happening. You have to decide what piece of the research do you need to tell them about. So I did meetings at SAM, ASEP, and AUM three times a year. Again, we're unfunded, so I'm just catching the people that go to those studies. I did newsletters four times a year that were in between that to capture the information, and then emails probably monthly or periodically that just caught little bits. The emails would be a site would email me and say, we're having this problem. I would say, oh, this site fixed it, and then I would email everyone. This problem came up, this is how it was fixed, so that there was a group learning. And then phone calls with sites that had specific problems that I would deal with individually. This is an example of one of the newsletters for a reason. And really, it's just, um, it's a little bit of cheerleading. Hey, this site did great. This site's in first place with all the enrollment. This was the biggest problem we found. So it really went through a few positives, a few negatives, and then answered a few questions. And then I would tell them to save them because they were cumulative. It was a conversation we were keeping. One other thing I do want to point out, when you're doing research and you're trying to do something at a little bit higher level, which is really what you're talking about when you're talking about network research. One of the things that you can do that will improve your methodology is go to NIH and pull up their instructions for grant funding. They will have information on what they want you to do. That information is good for research. They want it because they want to know that you can do good research, but they walk you through certain things. So when you go and try and put in a clinical study, this is actually from NHLBI, they actually talk about their communication plan. The communication plan for a grant submission to NHLBI, just the communication piece, is a page and a half. It's a lot of information. And they walk you through within the communication plan, plan the eight things that you have to cover in the communication plan. So it tells you what to focus on when you're doing your own research. So this was reason. And again, we had a central site, which was UMass, but we also had regional sites. So because we didn't have funding, I wanted the regional sites to deal with the issues in their area, the day-to-day -day issues. So local sites reported to the regional site in a spoken wheel uh, formation so that it wasn't just one person answering the hundreds of emails that came in over uh, weeks. So the second thing I would say is critically important. Whenever you're doing a larger study and you're trying to keep the details going, is your timeline. So we talk about milestones when you're putting in a grant, and I'm going to share some examples. But the milestones you do are super important. And there's a bunch of milestones that happen pre-enrollment, before you start actually doing anything, and then post-enrollment and after enrollment is done. I'll show you some examples for that. But part of the milestones during the enrollment phase is understanding how are you going to enroll. What is, what is a reasonable amount of patients you expect to pull in from the network? It's a little bit harder and it's a little bit easier because you have multiple sites, so you can be wrong at one site, but over all of them you should actually have a decent idea of where you're going. And that'll tell you how much funding you need, but also how much effort you have to ask from everyone. You want to set assessment, you want to have goals for the people that you're enrolling so that you keep on task, or else these things dissolve and they fall apart. And then the timeline itself provides a mechanism to communicate with the team. So this is an example, again, of NHLBI's instructions. And they talk about the overall st the study timeline and key milestones. Their instructions are probably two pages of detailed instructions on what is a milestone, what you should include. And they give you some examples. 
Here's an example of a partial example of some milestones. You can see that this is a five-year study if you go across. And as you're going down, it gives you an idea of the tasks and when you want to complete them. So just writing this organizes your thought process and allows you to communicate better with the rest of your team. It will also tell you if you can even do the study. Because you can go through this and then realize, I can't do this study. It's going to take eight years. So you then have to change your methodology and do the whole thing, but you do it up front. And this right here just organizes everybody onto the same page. I can't stress this enough. If you've never done it, pull a clinical grant from any one of the NIH groups. This one was through um, NHLBI. But if you do the clinical, if you pull one of those, they'll have detailed instructions. And all you do is go through the detailed instructions for NIH, for those of you who haven't done it, are probably 80 pages long. Just look for the one that says milestones. You don't have to kill yourself reading 80 pages. It'll tell you where it is, and you can pull out the two or three pages that tell you how to write this section. And then the data entry, which again we had talked about. Setting up the database is a bit of a skill by itself, so you want to have someone who knows what they're doing, or at least someone who's done it once before so you can learn from that. You have to, if you centralize the data entry, then you control how good the data is, but you have to do it. If it's decentralized, everybody else puts it in, but then you have to clean the database. Of the two, cleaning the database takes way longer than taking the data and cleaning it as you put it in. So just in summary, when you're uh, planning to do this, put a lot of effort into the planning side of a network before you even do it. You don't want to waste your time because you only have so much time. And if you waste other people's time, they're never going to work with you again. So I put in a grant for NHLBI, and it took me 16 months of planning just to get to the the stage where we were going to start writing the grant. It takes a lot of time to pull some of this together. Now, some studies are easier than others. But number one, timelines and milestones, absolutely critical. And number two, communication. All right. We're off to the next talk. Thank you very much. So once again, my name is Sam Lam, and I'm going to be talking about network ultrasound research from the P2 network perspective. I have no conflict of interest to disclose. So what's a P2 network? The P2 network is an international consortium of pediatric point-of-care ultrasound experts and champions. Um, we've a pretty young organization. We've only been formed since 2014. We're only five years old. But one of the unique things that we did when we started to organize ourselves was that we decided that we want to have research as part of a core mission. So what we did is we have a research committee chair, and we make the research committee chair part of the executive team, and I am the current uh, research committee chair. That's why I'm doing this talk. So what happened is that when we went up there, um, when we start organizing ourselves, we sent out a survey monkey questionnaire to our members, and we asked them, what are the topics that you want to see uh, research on in pediatric point of care ultrasound. And we took the top three topics and we formed um, ultrasound, uh, and we formed ultrasound studies um, a core, I mean, a core steering committee around those topics. So, um, and right now we have one topic that is recruiting right now, which is in this exception study. And sorry, I'm just trying to figure out what happened here. Uh, and then um, we have two that's in development, and the two in development are the one that I am chairing. So the process um, that we're doing, it's pretty, um, pretty well set. So what happens is that we have regular meetings in person or over the phone, and we meet every month, every other month to develop the protocol. And because not everybody can make the meeting on, and every time, so we have our protocol on Google Docs so that people can look at the protocol, make comments, and make suggestions as we move along. So we have a lot of content experts in our group, and I'll be the first to admit that despite my little bit of research training, 
we are lacking in the methodology department. So what we've done is we need to make up for this methodological deficits. I've asked the core uh, steering committee members to go up, take their project to the research guru in the department or the division and vet it with them and make sure that with a sound protocol, make sure that we do the right thing methodologically before we move on. And one of the other things that we've gained in the recent months is that we have established a relationship with the PAMCRC, which is the Pediatric Emergency Medicine Collaborative Research Committee under the American Academy of Pediatrics. That would give us the methodological experts, they give us the database experts, and most importantly, they have people, um, what we call the execution experts, that know how to carry a research project, and it's going to help us out a great deal in terms of carrying our research project because we are fairly new and we're still learning our ropes around uh, this research network thing. So the whole process takes about a year or so. Um, what happens is that we have a year, we go through projects, and then we take it back to the research committee. We have it revised one last time, and then we bring it back to the P2 meeting and have it endorsed by the P2 network overall because we're a pretty small organization and then we make it an official P2 sponsored research project. This way we get credit for doing it as an organization and individually uh, we get recognized as well. So the development process is pretty similar to what you do if you're doing an individual research project except for the fact that when we ask the question, we want to ask the question that, that focus on a network research, a network research can answer. We also use the REDCap uh, database like everybody else and it, it's worked out pretty well for you. We have a uh, unique system of storing and transferring images which we're going to go through uh, in our next slide and then we QA 100% of images. Pretty similar to Ramo is doing. I think he QAs 100% of the images as well. So in terms of image transfer and storage, we use the clip the identifier by Ben Smith. So if you don't know what it is, um, I don't know if, I, I don't think I've um, ever met Ben Smith, he's a mysterious figure, but basically he's a computer whiz and he come up with this program that would take an ultrasound clip, take out all those identifying information so that you can actually send it over email and not violate any HIPAA rules. Um, although if you want to be strict about it, then you're still sending over insecure email. So that's a little bit of a problem there if you're a lawyer or IRB. So what we did for our second project and the third project is that we're going to add on the, an additional layer, which is a red cap. So we have the red cap database for basically ultrasound data entry. What I did is that I went up to a research institute, I said, well, you know, WebCap, can we just store images in a WebCap? And they said, yes, we can do it. You can upload the images, you can download images, we tested it out. As long as the institution have the memory to do it, it's actually doable. And we've downloaded a number of clips, it seems like it's functioning reasonably well. So there's an added layer as well that's HIPAA compliant that the IRB is going to be happy with it. I put in QPath there. I mean, most of us have small shops. We don't actually use a lot of QPath because we don't have enough volume to do it. But it seems like it's a good solution, and I'd be curious as to if anybody's using QPath has done that in image storing and transfer, and I'd be curious to hear your experience about it. Um, so what are some of the challenges and lessons learned from doing network research in the PDH world? First of all, protocol gets 10 times more complicated with multi-center involvement, the majority of which actually is regulatory, regulatory compliance. So um, before I went to the P2 network and did some study, we did actually a six institution pediatric skin and soft tissue ultrasound study around the POCUS world. And we have one site in Canada. And as soon as the lawyers and the IRB heard about that, that's going to be a Canadian site. We're going to be transferring data across the international border. We're going to be sharing images across the international border. They threw a fit at us. It took another two weeks and then back and forth for us to just like, you know, hey, you know, this is not like a big deal because we're taking all those um, uh, PHI and then it took another two weeks for that to get settled. And this is on top of the stack of paperwork, the, the tons of emails I've had with a total of six IRBs and imagine having like 20, 40 IRBs and, and the stack of paperwork to deal with. So this is heavy lifting and you have to really think about it when you're doing network research. As Ramo has said, it's, it's important to set time frame and deadlines 
but because of all those unpredictable events, I would advise people to be flexible at it. But we're ER doctors, we're good at it. That's not a big deal. If there was one message, I'm gonna go through, Rommel has three messages. If you've got one message we're gonna put through in my, my experience in research, it's just being um, very explicit about defining outcome and paying attention to details. Going back to my pediatric skin and soft tissue study, we, um, I, I could be more naive in assuming that every single institution does ultrasound the same way, take care of the patient the same way. It, it doesn't happen. What happens is that one of our site actually does not drain the abscesses. All the skin abscesses get drained by pediatric surgery. Take into the operating room, none of the ER doctors drain the abscesses. So we have to go back. We found out after the fact we have to go back and modify our protocol after the fact. So the important thing is really to be very explicit and um, to minimize variability so that people are not confused. People are, it is, there's no ambiguity in your protocol. So what I advise is just define your outcomes very explicitly and spell as much detail as possible in your protocol. Now talking about things we did wrong, one thing we probably did reasonably good, it's the training video. So we started with this skin and soft tissue abscess study, a skin and soft tissue infection study. What we did is basically we have a um, institution make a training video that's available to our participating institutions in terms of what images we want to get, what views we want to get, how we're going to save the images, and it actually beats the study menu that's sitting on the shelf collecting dust. Nobody looks at a study menu, but you have a training video there. People can look at it. Um, people can, um, you know, refresh if they need to, and it is very helpful in order to tell people what we're doing and be uniform in terms of data collection. So we are ER doctors, we like instant gratifications, but uh, in doing research, you have to be patient. And another message I want to get through is to get help as much as you can. Back, borrow, and steal. You can never get too much help. Um, there, there's so many things I didn't know when I started doing network research, and I've asked so many people, and they've been so helpful to us. Uh, you want to spend time, once again, you want to spend time fine-tuning your protocol, it's going to spare you a lot of grief later on. And worst case, it's going to spare you a lot of review, uh, review criticism when you submit for journal review. Um, I do a little bit dif differently when your data start coming in. I actually like to clean them as I go because we didn't have that much data. I feel like it's easier to um, clean the data while it's fresh in the other investigator's mind, and I just clean data, I get back to them, ask them questions so that they can just get back to me uh, as soon as they can. Uh, funding is important. A lot of them you can get the volunteers to do. You can get volunteers to recruit for you. You can get volunteers to take care of some of the paperwork. But really, some of the help that you're getting, for example, logistic support or um, statistical help, it's gonna take money. So right now, we, our, our, our projects have internal funding, so we get probably like twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars at institution at the central site to take care of the most of the logistics stuff. But ideally you want to get external funding to make it viable. So in terms of external funding, if you want to aim high at the NIH, the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute is the place to go because actually one of our study it's uh, pediatric lung ultrasound. Of course the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development is one of the other NIH institute that exclusively focus on pediatric research as well. Uh, the National Capital Consortium of Pediatric Device Innovation might pertain to us because we do some ultrasound. The Hoot Foundation, thanks to Dr. Gaspari Romolo, um, only supports research, pediatric research in New England area, so I'm not eligible being in California. Um, also there's some foundation grants being an SAEM, SAEM Foundation and then the Emergency Medicine Foundation, which is a branch of ASAP as well that can help you uh, do a small amount of grant. So some of the less encouraging things that's going to happen when you do network research is that remember we talk about the um, collaborative research spirit in the academic world. A lot of people volunteer initially because of this collaboration period, uh, spirit, but in the end, a few would do most of the work, and that's just life. I mean, life happens, people drop off, they have things to do, they get spread thin, and they get called by the chairman to do other stuff, and that's just what happened, and you have to anticipate that. Um, there's investigative fatigue, and ideally you want to keep your project two years. It's kind of hard to keep it two years, but um, one to two years is optimal if you can manage it. As Walmo has mentioned, you need to do frequent updates to keep the uh, rest of the group engaged, 
and you have to get the authorship early. And what we do is we have a manuscript oversight committee uh, comprised of people that are not in the core steering committee to do that and that will adjudicate the authorship if we need to. So some of the things I want to do ideally, I, I think the future direction and network of some research. Number one is pick up, you know, to pick out the topic that's worth studying uh, to doing network ultrasound research. We're getting better at it. I think we are kind of picking at a topic that can only be answered in a network fashion and not repeating the studies that could be done at an individual site level. So we're getting a little bit better um, at that. And of course, we need to get funding to do that as well. And that is, you know, the question comes in. Um, a lot of the criticism I get in doing focus research is the subjectivity of focus, you know, they talk about how subjective it is, how operator dependent it is, and if you can come up with a way that makes your focus research less subjective, that would be a, a good way to get attention outside of the focus world. What we're trying to do is to build infrastructure for pediatric focus research so that if you have an idea, come to P2 Network, we have a protocol, we have some phrases, we have a structure to get it done, and we're somewhat successful at that because we're in our third project. And ideally, what I want to do is basically build a pediatric um, focus database or registry, and that would be a gold mine for pediatric ultrasound research. And that's going to be um, take a lot of funding because you're going to have data analysts, you're going to have data specialists. But that is my ideal dream. We are not doing any data verification. We're not doing any site inspection because of lack of funding. But that would be ideal as well. And central IRB is going to save a lot of regulatory work if we can manage that as well. So in summary, um, my teaching points are you have to invest time up front to hash out your protocol. It's going to save you a lot of grief down the road. It's, you have to pay attention to details, details, and details because um, what's going to happen is going to be explicit. You're going to standardize all your protocol. You're going to minimize variability at your site to ensure that you collect quality data. You want to surround yourself with experts, the most important of which I think is having a regulatory guru. It's going to take a little bit of money. Most of the regulatory stuff is, cannot be done by a volunteer, but I think it's well worth the effort there. So um, that's all I have to say. I just want to put in a plug for the P2 network. We are having a meeting this Friday and Saturday. So if you want to come check us out, just come to me afterwards and I will just hook you up and uh, let me know. Thanks a lot. Thank you. First, I want to thank you for coming to the session. I know it's an early morning session. I appreciate you showing up here. Um, I have been a part of the steering committee for a reason from the beginning. Um, I've gone through that growing pains. Um, it's been a, a great experience and uh, uh, definitely I've learned a lot. Um, what I'm going to talk about is slightly different from what Ronald and uh, uh, Sam discussed. Um, it seemed like more appropriate to bring this up in the SAM forum. It's an educational meeting. So definitely I think there is a um, place for um, uh, POCUS educational research. And I know uh, this is something uh, even in the section meeting, our academy meeting yesterday, we talked a lot about um, uh, curriculum, uh, fellowship, uh, FPD, and so on. So it makes sense to discuss uh, about a multi-center uh, POCUS education research. So I don't want to go in details because most of your experience, otherwise you won't show up at 8 o'clock. You already have done a lot of research. Um, so uh, why we do a multi-center research, obviously it's for large N and it makes it more generalizable and uh, so on. Um, so why do, we need, why do we need a multi-center POCUS education research? That's a specific question. So um, I guess uh, in my mind when I started this, I'm like, um, are we training what we are supposed to train uh, the residents in, in terms of ultrasound? Uh, because there seem to be a lot of variability across the country. And the way we're training, are we trans is that translating into good patient outcomes? Um, and then in terms of, uh, like I said, new curriculum, um, and then milestones, uh, and then now the fellowship certification and so on, I think it's become even more important right now 
to do uh, Hocus Educational Research. So as I'm thinking most of you uh, are well experienced and have expertise. Uh, in POCUS, so if you talk to people, the, the type of scanning protocols they have in place are going to be not the same, right? So, and as advanced as we are compared to the other clinical specialties in terms of doing POCUS, still, we don't have a lot of data on learning curves. I think the, the few are published from, are from Ramallah's shop, so there is need for the data. And again, most of the training and the curriculum is based on consensus, right? So really need good data on what we're implementing based on the consensus documents and recommendations and so on. And then obviously it's great to have more uh, data on competency assessment uh, since we have uh, milestones, or we're all implementing milestones in our shops. And then the last leads, you know, uh, multi-center research makes it more valid in terms of dissemination and so on. So I have been a part of all these uh, four or five studies, so I'll share briefly my experiences uh, in doing this study, in doing these studies. The first one was, um, this was back in, I believe, like 2009 or 2010, um, we did this study. At that point, there was only core AUS document, um, uh, I don't even know if we call it AUS at that point, core document, um, saying that, you know, these are, these are the guidelines we recommend, uh, this is how you should be doing POCUS at residency programs. So we, we wanted to see actually what kind of applications were being taught and how, what, we, what, are, what actually is being used in the emergency department and if fellowship really would make an impact on the type of ultrasound examination being performed with residents. Um, so we, we, we sent out the, uh, uh, we selected like nine, it's a cross-section study, we selected, it's a convenient sample, nine centers and collected the data. Uh, certainly from the data uh, suggests that at that point at least, fellowships did make a difference, how the residents were trained, type of exams performed, number of exams performed, and so on. Uh, moving forward, fast forward to 2011, there were uh, milestones implemented. So then we wanted to see how, how often, um, how many programs are actually following milestones, implementing milestones, how often they are assessing the competency uh, every six months, every year, or what kind of tools are they using, what kind of um, QA they are performing. So we sent out to all residency programs uh, and collected data on that. Um, and it was really good uh, data uh, in terms of, I think about like 80, 84 programs were actually having some sort of uh, competency assessment at the point. I think it was in 2012, uh, memory serves right. So like about 15, 16 percent of programs were not doing any competency assessment at the point. I'm sure things have evolved since then. And the next study we did was, I believe it's in 2015 or 2016, then we really wanted to see, well, okay, we have recommendations, we have milestones, so what do residents think about these um, milestones and the applications we teach? Do they think it's meaningful for them to learn what we recommend in their clinical practice? So we asked all those questions and they differed from the milestones and the core AUS, core applications and advanced applications recommendations. So what residents thought were slightly different. So that gives, like in our shop, we get an opportunity to kind of tweak our curriculum, how we teach it. And because we know a majority of residents go out and practice in the community setting, so we should be tweaking our, um, whatever we teach based on what residents think uh, in how they, what future setting they're going to practice. And then neuroblocks took off. So we wanted to see the next study how do you teach neural blocks in your shop? Do you have a curriculum? Do you have in agreements with uh, certain services like orthopedics or anesthesia? So things like that, uh, we have asked um, entire all residency programs across the country. So we got some good data, and we that's when we found out a lot of people don't have agreements, and so we we also use the data to get better at our shop. And this is right now actually under review and second revision and whatnot. We wanted to see if are there gender differences in terms of milestones assessments? Meaning, um, we, went, we asked for the data that has already been documented for four or five years uh, before. Essentially, we're asking who assessed the residents uh, in terms of gender, are the male or female evaluators? And then we collected the data based on gender, male and female residents, and looked at year one to year three, in terms of attaining their milestones, baseline versus graduating milestones, what are the differences in terms of general assessments? Were, 
are males attaining faster or are they gradu graduating at a higher level compared to females? So we have some data here. Um, and then this is like a, a large uh, study, a stratified pros um, sample across the country. So this, was, this is under review right now uh, with the second revision. So definitely, uh, you know, we have learned a lot. So what we tried to do is we wanted to see feasibility of the curriculum implementation. And then we asked for assessment data. And then we asked sometimes residency directors and sometimes uh, ultrasound program directors. And you know, one, one other survey I didn't put out is actually by teaching how to do ultrasound and vascular access, did it make a difference in how often you use for patient uh, care? So uh, that was a different study. So we collected some patient outcome data as well when we, uh, when we were doing these um, studies. So the challenges were, what we encountered were like, there's so much variation training across the country. Some people have two week rotations, some people have four, some people are doing the first year, some people are doing the third year. Um, in terms of curriculum, um, some people are just giving didactic sessions, some people are just giving online curriculum, um, and some were using like uh, iBook as their um, Bible, and they have, we use that, and we, use, we wrote questions for each chapter for assessment. Some were just using mom material chapter, um, book, book, uh, the reference book. So there was a lot of differences in terms of how residents are being taught across the country. And then scanning protocols, QA. So we have, we have QPAD, somebody has some other homegrown database. So there are differences in terms of how uh, they were doing the QA. And even in the assessment, uh, you know, uh, some people had ASCII, some people had SDOTs, and some people were just doing the QA off QPath, and that's how they were doing the assessment. So what we realized is we were collecting the data. Uh, we asked them, like, free text documents, uh, statements, if they wanted to say anything. They would, we noticed that there is a lot of variation when we're collecting these data. If that's what your research question is, that's great. But if it's not, then you have to account for all of those when you're writing the manuscript. What are the differences uh, in terms of assessment and training and so on? So that became a little bit challenging for us in some manuscripts how we write it. I don't want to talk of communications because Ramallah talked about it. I want to tell one thing. Ramallah also had like a newsletter or something like that every three months, updating, you know, things like that. So there will really reason with, uh, as a group, it, it was great to have that um, either face-to-face -face or emails and so on. The communications were great. So in terms of IRB approval, I want to uh, put out a couple of things. So IRB approval, when I asked uh, certain um, sites, they were like, we don't need IRB approval for these kind of studies. I'm like, you know, we, when we write and submit to journals, we have to say something. We got IRB approval, or no IRB. So you need to give me something about IRB approval. If you don't need it, I need that statement as well from your IRB. So things like that, need to give you small details, even if people say things, I think I would go and ask Ask them and, and send you something concrete so that when you're submitting uh, a manuscript, that won't be a problem. And compliance is uh, one of the major issues, right? So people agree to do things and they don't agree to do things. And how do you deal with that? Um, some of your friends and things like that. And then the, the reason I put the convenience sample is the first few studies were convenience samples. It became really hard to publish. Then one journal after journal is going to the fourth and fifth and whatnot. So we learned our lessons when we came to this last study. We're all like stratified cluster samples. And so the, the, the last but one study I showed, uh, like first go to AEM, because of the methodology, uh, very few questions were asked and it was easy to publish compared to my three other studies where you know, methodology wasn't tight. Uh, so think about it. Authorship is a main issue because when we ask people from 20 sites, people say, you know, I have uh, two other collaborators that are on my site, two investigators. So then 20 times 360, right? So who, how many authors do you want to put? How many journals may not allow? So I have to write to Dr. Klein first uh, before you even agree for these sites. Dr. Klein, how many would you allow for us? So. And he was very generous, whatever you do. And so then we picked, you know, uh, some sites were one, some sites were two. We're very really liberal because we want to get the job done and work with everybody. So I think it's important to sort that out in terms of authorship. So who, how many investigators on each site could be put? I and mean, obviously there's variation among the journals. Some people let you put everybody. Some people just want to put that, okay, reason network and maybe at the footnote all the names and things like that. You want to be upfront with all, everybody, all the investigators. They're not upset. They put the work and now they're not listed. So I, I, I actually go to the potential journals we're going to submit and ask them how many authors would you accept. So, that, that's, so it worked out really well for us. So in terms of logistics, so you want to know what kind of governance structure you want to have, even if it's like education study. Who's controlling what? Um, in terms of collaborators, 
do you want your friend to participate in the study? Like, Nick Theoni is my friend, maybe he doesn't get the job done, so I don't want Nick Theoni in my study. So, so or you want somebody who can get the job done. So you, you want to kind of uh, understand, uh, like, and each sites will have like partnership agreements, even if it's an education study, partnership agreements some sites need. And they originate, uh, we were talking about this yesterday with Ramla, from your own institution, how you want to do partnership uh, agreements. And then compliance. So every institution is different. Even though we're University of Arizona, our residents are ban our corporate employees. So before we ask any questions, we got to get banner permission because there are banner employees. So I can't just go ask a question of residents. Here is a survey. So, um, so there are institutional uh, things you, you would have to follow. And then how important it is to um, kind of balance out the geography. So when we're doing studies, we know there's some variations between northeast versus southwest. We uh, in California, as maybe we do slightly different ultrasound. Uh, the way we teach, the Northeast may be different. So we want to get the cluster samples, so we stratified everything. So you, you kind of think through, hey, is geography important for me? Again, like I said, randomization, stratification, I think makes your job easy, less limitations to put in, and you go to a better journal. Uh, so that was our experience when we were publishing these studies. Time is important. Even if it's an education study, I realized pretty soon, if you come into things like this, and you know, Ram will probably put a significant amount of time writing this canned email, sending to everybody and whatnot, so plan your time ahead. Uh, whatever the emails and things like that, it would, they would take significant amount of time. Face-to-face -face meetings and meetings, you know, coming to the same conference is not an easy thing either. So we had like the first day, pre-convention day, 8 o'clock meeting, we were like, oh, how many people are going to show up here? So, and the first day. So, um, and then having online organiz organization tools, I think it makes your life so much easier any sort of like we were using REDCap or whatever the database system now we have as so many things I think uploading things uh, HIPAA compliant of course uh, online data entry all this stuff I think makes it a lot easier I would plan ahead I would have that expertise in hand even if it's not in our department seek out to somebody else so that's what we do when we need help like this we go to what we call a bios 5 institute right in our place we ask them if they could help us and again, um, um, Sam talked a little bit about this. Uh, how do you acquire uh, image data? How do you, because worksheets, we, my worksheets are very different from Ramwell. So because I have specific needs I need for my research purposes and he has something else. So if you're collecting data, so we're all in QPath, cons uh, we were planning about doing like a QPath consortium, then we realized our worksheets are all very different. So then maybe we need to have some common fields in those worksheets when we're collecting the data. So that could be fed. And then are there certain required images we all need to get. So that could be fed as well for research purposes. So think about those things. IRB, we talked about it. You know, sometimes they take the, uh, somebody else's IRB and then you get approved as well, but I would be extremely careful. I would ask everybody to give me uh, something about IRB before uh, I get this, um, I, I have that site data for myself. Personnel, think about residents and think about medical students who are helping you. And again, talk to them about authorships and things like that which, because you may not be able to offer. Maybe they will just want to meet their scholar quest or some MSRP pro uh, requirements and so on, that's great. Um, but just talk about that ahead, even if it's an education project. Um, the reason I say that is one of our investigators uh, did something like that and then uh, he couldn't put the name and that student, medical student graduated and wrote a letter to Dean that he participated in the study and he was not listed as an author. The investigation ensued. Then he has to go answer a lot. Of, so think about it, something very small like that could actually become like a big pain for you eventually. Um, uh, we'll talk about funding in a second here, but always nice to have a little bit of funding from somewhere, even if it's an education project. There are always going to be non-compliant people. There's always going to be investigator fatigue, so you, you, are, you should be ready for that, and you should have a plan how you're going to deal with this. So we actually had some sites in the stratified sample. The first site we agreed to do, we gave them a certain time, and then it, it's written in the protocol. If they didn't do it in three weeks, we already told them, you're out. So we have next one, a statistician would give the next center for us. We would go to that person. So you need to have a backup plan. If somebody doesn't do it, if they agree to do it, you're not sitting there for a long time to do it. But again, you can methodology, it should be included so the methodology is tight. You're not randomly pulling some friends uh, just because I like Nick, maybe I'm not asking because this guy didn't do it. So it still needs to be methodologically tight. So again, you should be able to make some tweak for protocol depending on how things go. Uh, just be prepared for that. As far as funding, what I have noticed is the journals which are publishing educational stuff, gone really high, like proliferated but funding for medical uh, uh, education research but there are actually a couple of lectures great lectures uh, yesterday and day for yesterday it's not as 
it's not on par with the number of studies we do. So funding is really tight, especially if it comes to education research. So we have always been discussing, and if any of you have um, uh, desire to do this, I think it's great to have just like an education network, our registry, the way we can archive just for education purposes without any HIPAA data and documentation. I think this is something really needed at this point. Um, and the last thing I want to point out is if you are going to get funding, you know, uh, most of the federal agencies probably would give funding for a simulation type of research, uh, include other disciplines because other people are also doing research right now, nursing, paramedics, and so on, that makes it interprofessional education and things like that make more uh, sound better when you're applying uh, for uh, uh, external funding. Uh, again, always try to see, like we wanted to put, we were drawing a protocol, we put the vascular access as one of the components uh, to make it like, it, it, it is a high, high impact outcome, but think about high impact outcome, but on the, on the paper, if you include them, I think that would meet your likelihood of getting funding probably much, much higher. Again, we always like prior collaborations, prior publications would make it legit. That's what we've been doing. We try to publish as much as together. That way when we go for the big funding, we, then we, it, it makes it more legitimate that we have already collaborated, collaborated before and we have published before. And that, that's no different for education studies as well. Everybody in the department has some funding, seed funds, College of Medicine has funding, university has funding. I have some sites that getting both in, both in the department and the university and some of the outside organizations who fund for educational research. So think about that. And they are, I have a list of things and they're all available online just for purely for education purposes. They fund the research, but I know there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of money, but any money helps in terms of um, um, for the logistics and getting some help. So. I think the focus education research should be geared towards the gaps in how we train people, how we assess uh, residents, our medical students, uh, our other um, um, learners. And I think I would be careful about how, you, how tight it should be your methodology. It makes it easier for you to publish. Think about challenges and logistics and have a backup plan. And there is funding out there. It may not be much, but uh, I would highly recommend you pursue the funding, whatever education study it might be you're planning to do. Thank you so much. So I think we're getting a little tight on time, but if you have, um, if we have time for like one question or one or two quick comments, anybody have any questions or comments for us? Yeah, very nicely done. <laughs> so we are actually on time, and uh, thank you very much for coming. And I hope to get this conversation started and make connections out there and uh, just help advance the field. Thank you very much again.